You might just hear my roommate's cat meowing the entire time. Very sorry if that gets distracting. When you look at another person's face, what do you see? For the philosopher Levinas, no matter how well you know someone, there is always something unknown about the other. I mentioned Levinas in my self-centeredness is not self-care video, but I wanted to expand on another part of his theory about the human face. For Levinas, you could be married to someone for 20 years and they could still surprise you by doing something you never thought they would do. He doesn't think there is any way to know someone entirely, in totality. The human face is the way in which this absence of total knowledge appears to us. When we look at someone else's face, we are met with both known and unknown. I see you, but I do not know you. But what does it mean to see yourself as a stranger? To become self-estranged? In Jose Medina's book, The Epistemology of Resistance, he describes self-estrangement as, quote, becoming perplexed about who we are. That is to say, becoming strangers to ourselves in particular areas of our life and looking at ourselves with fresh eyes affords us opportunities to interrogate what we find in the most intimate corners of our perspective and to recognize its limitations and the possibilities of correction and improvement. It is a practice of critical self-questioning, of unmasking the social construction of supposedly the natural order of things. This has been at the root of social progression throughout history. It was once considered natural to ban women from getting an education. The fact that only men were allowed to wear pants was once accepted as an obvious fact. But women's rights movements started to question this natural organization of gendered activity. They prompted broader society to view themselves as a stranger. If you approached your beliefs as belonging to someone unknown, what assumptions and limitations would you accuse that stranger of? How strange is it to be someone who believes that a piece of clothing, an object devoid of meaning until it is given meaning, is treated as having a natural gendered essence? The purpose of self-estrangement is to make us more diligent and just epistemic subjects. Epistemic subject meaning an individual who can have knowledge about the world. If we want to claim knowledge, then we should also be constantly reflecting on our own knowledge to see if it needs improvement. This prevents us from subjecting others to wrong and sometimes harmful systems of knowledge. I thought this would make a good video topic because the internet is not so great at promoting self-reflection and open-mindedness. People tell me it's useless to try to convince the internet that it's okay to be wrong or to be confused. You don't need to feel like you have the definitively correct stance on everything. That's what discourse is supposed to exist for. To get a grounded sense of what self-estrangement is, I think it's worth talking about a particular book. Mama died today. Or maybe yesterday. I'm not sure. If you've heard that line before, it famously comes from the opening of Albert Camus' book, The Stranger. The internet seems to love Camus. He was a bit of a celebrity in addition to being a philosopher. He even made it to the Tumblr blog, Fuck Yeah History Crushes. This tall drink Mediterranean sun tea brought us The Stranger, The Plague, The Myth of Sisyphus, and many more, examining the absurd and the human condition. Though his truths may be dark, his hot bod and brilliant mind fill my heart with sunshine. So very brief summary of the book, the main character, Merceau, is autistic. No, really, Camus based Merceau off of his autistic friend. But let's brush that aside for a second. Merceau is a man who seems indifferent to everything most people would normally be emotionally struck by. As the first line of the book suggests, when his own mother dies, he doesn't seem phased at all. He doesn't even remember when it happened. When he's put on trial for murdering someone, a lawyer is screaming in his face about how he has no soul, and Merceau seems bored. He's just thinking about how hot the temperature of the courtroom is. Merceau is one of Camus' many literary characters that represent his theory of absurdism and how different individuals respond to becoming aware of the absurd. We have all these plans to make our lives meaningful, but ultimately, everyone dies. We have concepts like eating dinner at 6 p.m. or letting a judge, a single person, dictate the future of thousands of other people's lives. And many people act like these are just natural, concrete truths about reality. When really, I could call my morning meals dinner instead of breakfast, and what difference does it make? Merceau especially has this moment of unmasking the fake certainty of our practices when he is sentenced to death by the court. 
Quote, Despite my willingness to understand, I just couldn't accept such arrogant certainty. Because, after all, there really was something ridiculously out of proportion between the verdict such certainty was based on and the imperturbable march of events from the moment the verdict was announced. The fact that the sentence had been read at 8 o'clock at night and not at 5 o'clock. The fact that it could have been an entirely different one. The fact that it had been decided by men who changed their underwear. The fact that it had been handed down in the name of some vague notion called the French or German or Chinese people. All of it seemed to detract from the seriousness of the decision. I was forced to admit, however, that from the moment it had been passed, its consequences became as real and as serious as the wall against which I pressed the length of my body. Now, Jose Medina doesn't talk about absurdism, and Albert Camus doesn't use the word self-estrangement, but I see a connection between these two concepts. As Aidan Curzon Hobson describes in this article, the absurd is, quote, the great educator, the catalyst for fundamental doubt, and in turn, lucid reflection. When we are caught in an unfamiliar or unsettling experience, it sweeps what we thought we knew under the rug. We are forced to doubt our beliefs, which, yes, can be a challenging anxiety, but it also is the key to liberation. Camus himself said that doubt is both the bane and the enlightenment of man. In the book, Merceau is like this great educator. By constantly bringing other characters to doubt, he constantly subverts people's expectations. He challenges the tradition of marriage when he tells his lover that marriage is nothing serious. Do you want to marry me? It doesn't really matter. When he can't give his lawyer an answer to any of his questions, the lawyer goes from kind to frustrated. In fact, throughout the book, what other characters seem to hate most about Merceau is his acceptance of doubt. Do you believe in the almighty God? No. Do you want my life to be senseless? It feels like the lawyers and the judge would be so much happier if Merceau just admitted that he was a psychopath or that he hated his mom. Sure, he would be disagreeing with them and he would hold a, an awful stance, but at least he has a stance, at least he has some sort of opinion. Perhaps then, Merceau is demonstrating to us that it is the power of doubt that holds the greatest yet most disruptive potential. Merceau also has moments of becoming a stranger to himself. He doesn't think of himself as a dangerous criminal, he's just a regular French guy. Yet as he's sitting on trial, he realizes all these faces staring at him are searching for the criminal in him. He feels a dissonance between his reality and how others perceive him. Uh, but isn't that the purpose of being in prison? I forgot that I'm being punished. People like Merceau, who present a reality different from the one we expect, are objects of strangeness that challenge our mainstream norms. It reminds me of this book written by the professor Kira Kremen. Kremen? I'll be honest, I'm not even halfway through the book, but the beginning that I've read is already very interesting. When the professor began cross-dressing, she describes her experience of being an object of strangeness. Her appearance causes dissonance between what people intend or expect to see on her body Mikey's going feral. She causes dissonance between what people expect or intend to see on her body and what they actually do see. These moments of dissonance are really powerful. They call upon people to question a once unquestionable order of gender and clothing. Now, I know what you're thinking. Olivia, but what if I'm addicted to rotting in bed on my phone? Can I still reflect on my beliefs and become a more critical thinker? Well, lucky for you, this video is sponsored by Ground News, a website, but also an app that gathers all the world's media in one place so you can get the most holistic coverage breakdown of any story. For example, if I click on this story about Trump's political fundraising group, I can find important information like the total number of sources reporting on a story, the political affiliation of each article, which then gives you a general idea of how the whole issue has been politicized. You can then click directly on a new source and read that article. They have a whole methodology page dedicated to explaining how they calculate political affiliation. I can also follow specific topics based on location, topic, person, or source. For example, there's feminism, psychology, even Tucker Carlson. I particularly like the blind spot feed, which shows you stories that are over or under reported by the left and right. 
Part of self-estrangement is to read about topics or experiences that you are unfamiliar with so as to expand the limits of your understanding. And I think the blind spot feed does a great job of helping you do that. It's true that a lot of the stories in this section are sensationalized because they're reported on by mostly one side, but it's still important to be aware that these are the types of stories that impact other people's worldviews. Go to ground.news slash alisanvia. You can subscribe for as little as $1 a month or get 30% off unlimited access through my link. Please ditch Twitter as your main source of news. I beg you. Ground News is also right there in the App Store. It's free if you just use the link. Merceau seems to be a master at self-estrangement. That's why he is so utterly aware of the absurdity of the world. But he actually seems to be too good at questioning. It leads him to a nihilistic skepticism where because he unmasks the constructed nature of everything, he doesn't believe anything has meaning. He ends up saying there's nothing about life that makes it worth living. Quote, Deep down, I knew perfectly well that it doesn't much matter whether you die at 30 or at 70, since in either case, other men and women will naturally go on living, and for thousands of years. In fact, nothing could be clearer. Whether it was now or 20 years from now, I would still be the one dying. But despite these words, he still feels his heart excitedly leap at the thought of living longer. The trouble was that I would somehow have to cool the hot blood that would suddenly surge through my body and sting my eyes with a delirious joy. It would take all my strength to quiet my heart, to be rational. This shows how you can practice self-estrangement wrong. When the only tool you use for questioning is crude logic, it fails to capture crucial features of the human experience. Merceau measures meaning via certainty. The only meaning to life is its end, because death is the only certain feature about life. Therefore, nothing in life matters. When dissecting whether an argument like this is logically valid, yes, certainty is crucial. The definition of logical validity is that if the premises are true, the conclusion must necessarily also be true. But if we expand our toolbox outside of logical rules, why should certainty be synonymous with meaning? At the end of the book, Merceau becomes extremely angry at a chaplain for acting as if religion offers certainty in his life. You are so certain about everything, but I am sure of what I am. My mother doesn't matter. Nobody matters, really, but especially not your God. However, I think Merceau is mistaken here. Believing in religion is not the same as believing in certainty. It is a leap of faith, as Kierkegaard famously described. When you realize the world's cold indifference to the meaning of your choices, it's easy to become paralyzed in a sea of possibility. If nothing you do matters, then there is no way to judge how one possible course of action is better than another. But people choose to commit to religious beliefs anyway, regardless of whether that choice can be rationally proven. In an ambiguous, absurd world, the only answer is to embrace ambiguity. Quote, when freedom is misused, anxiety takes on a pathological character, but the cure is not the total elimination of anxiety. Rather, what is crucial is to learn to be anxious properly. Whoever has learned to be anxious in the right way has learned the ultimate. It's not only religious people that take leaps of faith. We choose to commit to relationships all the time, without any certainty of whether they'll end horribly in 10 years or whether the person will be alive tomorrow. We decide to bring children in the world without guarantee that they'll grow up happy. There are absolutely better ways of practicing self-estrangement than Merceau, so that self-estrangement serves social progress and compassion, instead of melting you into a nihilistic puddle. If you watched my video The Desire to be Sad, or have read Nietzsche's Genealogy of Morality, you'll know Nietzsche's historical account of how good used to be associated with the noble, strong people. But then the meaning of good got reversed when priests started conspiring with the masses. But what I failed to mention in that video is how this historical story is almost certainly fictional. If you read the book, Nietzsche uses very fantastical language. It low-key sounds like a fairy tale. Not low-key, high-key. But Nietzsche's goal isn't to give you the most complete, accurate account of history. Instead, he is using genealogy, which is a retelling of how our present came to be, as a political tool. By crafting an alternative history, he shows us how our current morals are not necessarily objective truths. Genealogy asks us to stop thinking about our present society, beliefs, structures, etc. as if they were just destined to be this way. I dissed high school history classes in my last video, I'm sorry to do it again, but in my high school history class, we learned about World War II like this. 
Well, if you look at history, World War II was bound to happen because Germany was super poor, people were desperate, desperate people are bound to fall for a strong charismatic authority. Boom, there was no stopping Nazi Germany. It was just a product of its causes. But genealogy, as Nietzsche used it, would not agree with this understanding of history. Genealogy challenges teleological notions of history where there is one fixed past. And if you just trace back the steps, you can find the single or at most few possible outcomes. In reality, history is a jumbled mess of stories and struggles, many of them that go untold. The reason why people think history progresses in a fixed straight line is just because for a long time, history was a tool to justify the natural right of those in power. In feudal societies and monarchies, history books said kings and aristocrats had a natural right to rule, and others just had a natural duty to obey. When eugenics gained popularity, a racist history of evolution argued that certain people came from historically inferior ancestors. Until recently, school curriculums did not acknowledge the history of indigenous communities. Or if they did, they portrayed our colonial past as a friendly diplomatic endeavor. By only speaking about some people in history and not others, it puts certain experiences at the forefront of historical memory. In Society Must Be Defended, Michel Foucault writes, History shows that what sovereigns and kings do is never pointless, futile, or petty, and never unworthy of being narrated. Everything they do can be, and deserves to be, spoken of, and must be remembered in perpetuity. Which means that the slightest deed or action of a king can and must be turned into a dazzling action and an exploit. Like, you know when white influencers start a new trend that really people of color have been doing for centuries? That's what happens when history glorifies any small action of some people and ignores literally histories of other groups. History only seems simple, unified, and natural when we forget about all the voices that go unheard. Foucault speaks from the perspective of these subjected voices. Quote, we do not have any continuity behind us. We do not have behind us the great and glorious genealogy in which the law and power flaunt themselves in their power and their glory. We came out of the shadows. We had no glory and we had no rights. And that is why we are beginning to speak and to tell of our history. I love talking about how Foucault and Nietzsche were in many ways on the same team because it really riles up the Jordan Peterson fanboys. Foucault and Nietzsche both believe that there is more than one way of understanding the past. As G. H. Mead suggested in his book, The Philosophy of the Present, the past is as open as the future. Thus, genealogy is a powerful form of self-estrangement because it makes us question natural histories and instead imagine alternative relations to the past. I don't think it's any surprise that practicing self-estrangement makes you more compassionate. Many marginalized communities suffer from hate or plain misunderstanding because there are people who refuse to question the limits of their own beliefs. Let's pick on TERFs for a second. I think part of why TERFs believe so strongly in the gender binary is because if there is no clean cut between women and men, they feel like their oppression as women will be downplayed. But I wanna let you TERFs know that that's not the case. Two things can be true at once. You can absolutely be oppressed as a woman. You also can receive social privilege from fitting neatly into one side of the gender binary. If you really are radical feminists, maybe do some self-estrangement. Reflect on why you believe in the gender binary, where does it come from, who does it serve, and who does it ultimately hurt? Well then, how do we expose ourselves to these experiences of doubt, as Merceau did to other characters? Um, humility, dialogue, and other stuff. Yeah, I didn't end up finishing the rest of this script because I've been so busy with law applications and grad school applications. I'm actually gonna end the video there. <laughs> I know it's really abrupt. Sorry for the messier and perhaps shorter video than usual, but let me know how you feel about self-estrangement. Please share how you think we can practice self-estrangement. Thank you so much for watching. Let's keep talking and I hope to hear from you soon. Mikey, you're so annoying. Whatever, this part's okay. Thank you to my Patreons for supporting this channel. AA, Adam Valon, Addison Drudge, Ali, Among Us Drip, Ardit Nella, Benny Arnold, Blueberry Hill, Bonzo, Brandon Puntos, CJ, Caleb Murdoch, C-Dub, Celestial, Chidozi Aloisi, Christian Ramirez Martinez, Cuddy Flam, Cyrus Orion, David, Deep Do Chatterjee, Depressed Laughter, Drew Singal, Drassel, Dusk M, Edrisel, Elliot Erickson, Extendo Trans, 
Fade Into You 33, Farman Panu, Flawlessness.com.au, Florence, Frida Gomez Rios, George D, George Zhang, Jerome's Cat, Guilherm Goncalves, Guo Jie Ku, Icro Axe, Isaiah Shepard, Jeannie, Jeremy Rodriguez, Jesse, JL underscore Arbor 21, Jiao Goncalves, John Nguyen, Jonathan Von Schroeder, Johnny Hubs, Joshua Basque, Juan Carlos Gonzalez, Kyle plus A, Kyle Bova. Ooh, I don't know how to pronounce this last name. Stranovsky. Laura Stranovsky. I'm sorry. Laura Clark, Leah Fasten, Leonardo, Lee Raz Levy, Lucas Kaiser, Love and Angels 420, Mal Pertwis, Michael Dufauchard, Mikey Jeans, Min CRCR, Minimal Encourager, Mire, MJ, MRQ02, Miatfo, Nasli, Neo Steel, Nietzsche is my dad, Odie, Papua underscore item, Patrick Lavi, Pink Freud wish Jung was here, it's a crazy name, Plenty Pack, Prism Machina, Rager 005, Rajan Singh, Remy Reyes, Rialo, Ronald Wilson, Ruin Double N, Ryan Nuki, Ryan Joe Lift, Sabrina Fior, Sam, Samya Zhu, Servant of Malabogia, Shadow Lord, Shelter, Sneezy Wheezy, Spaceman No Helmet, Steven Bollinger, Super Mutant Behemoth, Suvi, Texas underscore, Trojler the Bernadinator? <laughs> Mikey was not happy about that one. Will, William Bowen, Zoe Allred, and Zixing Li. Please flame me if I pronounce your name wrong and let me know what the right way to say it is. Bye!